Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be down here um, in Sutherland. Beautiful part of the world, beautiful day. Fantastic to, to, uh, to join you. Uh, so I am going to talk about native bees. My topic is the management of native bees. So I'm going to, to pretty much uh, um, jump straight in to, to native beekeeping. So I'm not going to give much background. Um, some of you have read the book, some of you have been to workshops, some of you have learned about native bees um, in other forums. And so hopefully there's a basis, a foundation of knowledge there that I can build from so I can just jump straight into the beekeeping part. Is that okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm sure all of you know that these native bees are stingless. So um, I'm not used to working around stinging bees actually. <laughs> so uh, a little bit nervous here, not really, but um, I'm sure these guys know what they're doing. Although that one came a bit close. <laughs> Maybe I'll stand over here. So um, we're fortunate this afternoon. We've got two hive designs, which both uh, work very well, and we can compare those. They're really quite different hive designs, but they do have one thing in common, and that is they use um, the, 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 they're based on the oath design. So many of you might, may have heard of the, the oath native bee design. It's the Australian original sorry, the original Australian Trigona hive, um, which uh, Trigona is the scientific name or was the scientific name for stingless bees when this hive was named about 30 odd years ago. And the characteristics of this hive are that it consists basically of two boxes that come together in a horizontal plane that you can separate to divide the hive. And that those footprint dimensions are 280 by 200. So we have interchangeability of hives between beekeepers. So it's a kind of a standard, it's not really a standard as such, there's no real standard, there's many people making boxes of all kinds of designs and shapes and sizes and materials, but um, this is one that is used by many people and it definitely works very well. Uh, an important characteristic of this design is its volume, so it's obvious that these hives are a lot smaller than honeybee hives. So I believe a honeybee single hive is 40 litres in volume. So a double hive, which is a very typical honeybee hive configuration, is 80 litres. And these hives um, in two sections are 8 litres. So they're one tenth of the volume of honeybee hives. And that is an ideal volume for these bees. That's one of the first things that we, um, we, that we uh, quantified when we first started keeping these bees was their volume in nature. And it's fairly easy to do that because these bees not having a sting physically protect their nest space in a hollow log to a much greater extent than honeybees do. So when a colony is being founded, a new colony, a daughter colony is being founded in a hollow tree by a parent colony, that it, it's not, a, it's not a, a very rapid, sudden process like in honeybees. It's a much more gradual process where the mother colony establishes the daughter colony with over months, even years. And one of the things they do, if they're existing, if they're, um, if they're founding a colony in a big space, is they wall off a section of that space. So typically, if you've got a hollow log, it might be whatever, 200 millimeters in diameter. They will wall off a... a a volume in there that equates to about eight litres. They can measure that somehow. So if it's a big wide volume, they'll put the walls down close to each other. If it's a narrow volume, they might put the walls up very high, but they'll create a space of about eight litres. So we've replicated that space. Um, oh, this is interesting. This is actually a natural enemy um, of stingless bees. So it didn't take her very long to find a potential uh, host. This is one of the worst pests that we have of stingless bees. Um, you can see her there. Can you see her from where you are? So she's called the hive surfered fly. Many of you will have heard of surfered flies, um, but this particular one is um, a wasp, a very good wasp mimic. It's not a wasp, it's a fly that mimics being a wasp for its own defense. And uh, it's a natural enemy, it lays its eggs. She's very excited. I can see her egg layer going a little bit crazy there at the back end. She's really excited. She's smelt that there's a potential hive here that she can lay eggs in and she's, um, she's um, doing that. So these bees are native bees. They do have a suite of natural enemies that we need to defend uh, the colony against. And I'll, that's very relevant to this talk because many aspects of hive design 
uh, relate to keeping natural enemies out of the box, more so than honeybees. Honeybees have a lot of pests, but they tend to be diseases. Honeybees ha have very few insect pests. I guess the varroa mite is an insect, is an arthropod pest, but most, most of the problems, most of the natural enemies of honeybees are pathogens caused by bacteria or uh, 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 diseases caused by pathogens such as bacteria or viruses or yeasts or whatever. In the case of stingless bees, most of the natural enemies are other insects like this hive surfed fly and, uh, and other species like that. So thank you for the demonstration. Now you can go. Um, so I'll explain some of the other characteristics of uh, stingless bees and then we'll do a split and if we have time we might split two hives so you can see you can see two every time you open a hive of stingless bees you see something different so I should go back to the basics and talk a little bit about the natural hive uh, nest architecture of these bees it's completely different to honeybees so we've all seen honeybee hives where many of you will keep honeybee hives, you know that they naturally build vertical combs made of wax and they rear their young, their brood, and they store their food in those vertical waxy combs consisting of a whole lot of hexagonal cells packed very efficiently together. You're all aware of that. Stingless bees do it completely differently. So their brood is in horizontal layers, not vertical. And their stored provisions, their food, uh, are in a different kind of cell that we call pots. And they surround the brood um, and uh, a kind of a three-dimensional structure. So you can't give these bees frames as you can honeybees. We give honeybees frames, we're really just kind of guiding their natural behavior, what they do anyway. So they haven't got that. So we're really, we're, we're, we're we're basing our beekeeping techniques on, on the natural biology, the natural nesting biology of these bees. But because the, because the stingless bees have a totally different architecture, we, we had to come up with a very different design. And this is very relevant when it comes to splitting a hive. Because when a honey beekeeper splits a hive, he or she can just pull frames out of, open a hive, as we just saw, pull frames out and check that the brood is the sufficient brood at the right stages and move it into an empty box. Um, and it's as simple as that. With the, our bees, you can't do that. You can't, to, to, to open a hive and to cut material out of one hive and move it into another causes a lot of damage to that hive. So the best way that we've come up with, was, well, there's a couple of ways, but the classic way, I should say, the first way that worked very well that we came up with to split these hives was to have two boxes that came together. It's really quite simple. Um, and we simply divide those boxes. And all the materials in one box stay put in that box, all the materials in the other box stay put in this box, and we just couple each, each full part to an empty part. That's what we call splitting hives. Now, it works a whole lot better if the hive is the right shape, um, because what we want to do is divide the brood, okay? And the brood, as we will see shortly, is in the shape of a sphere. It's a sphere of about two litres volume. And that sphere has, is about 150 millimetres wide, maybe a little bit taller. So that sphere fits very nicely in this space that's provided for it there. And here, all right, so when we um, divide the two boxes, um, the sphere should be divided in two, and we're getting a, more or less an equal distribution of brood between the bottom half and the top half. That's the, the most critical part of the splitting process, that we get plenty of brood in each half. There'll also be a lot of food in each half too, because the brood's only two litres, but these boxes are six litres. So there's still four litres of volume in this hive uh, for food storage. So there'll be plenty of food in each half as well. So we're giving each nucleus a very good start in life. Of course, there's one thing missing from one of the hives, and that is, I don't need to tell you, the queen. Um, you, uh, just like honeybees, uh, there's only one queen in a colony of social stingless bees. And the colony is very particular about that. They don't allow a second queen to, um, to take, to, to, to to develop or to mate, to leave the hive and, and mate with a male from another hive and then come back, unless the hive is queenless. Um, and 
A characteristic of, another characteristic of stingless bees that's quite different from honeybees is that hives routinely produce new virgin queens. They routinely produce about one in every thousand brood cells is a queen cell. Even when the hive is queen right, they're producing queen cells. So that's a fantastically useful characteristic for a beekeeper because you've got, um, see, so there's about 300 cells produced every day. So about one in a thousand is a queen cell. So about every three days or so, there's a new virgin entering that hive population. And that's important because if that hive becomes queenless for any reason, that young virgin is the ideal individual to take over as the new queen. That's very use, useful for us. Um, we, what typically happens is uh, in the, the half that's queen right, uh, they, they keep the old queen, but in the half that, that's queenless, um, the, uh, a, we hope that we'll see a virgin queen cell or there'll be a virgin queen present. And uh, she goes from being treated very badly by the workers in that hive instantly within a couple of hours the workers in that hive that's been created by the splitting of a hive and it's now queenless they recognize by the lack of queen pheromone that they are queenless and they need to recruit a new mated queen from one of their virgin queens and so they start treating uh, any queens present in the hive very well and allow her to go on a mating flight come back as a new mated queen it takes a while for her to start laying eggs so that's why it's very important and those eggs take 50 days to develop as an adult so as opposed to how long for workers of honeybees 21 days for honeybees 50 days for stingless bees they're much smaller insects you'd think they'd develop more quickly but no they develop more slowly so that's something you need to think about when you're keeping stingless bees that's that um you're not going to get, um, you're going to have this, you're, going to, you're waiting a long time for workers to join the workforce after a hive uh, has been made queenless. So it's very important to get that hive requeened, cells built and eggs laid um, before um, the, the old workers have died. Okay, I'm just going to talk a little bit about another hive design here. It's a bit of an alternative. It still belongs to what we call the oath um, you know, basic hive design. It still has a bottom box. Um, it's a little bit simpler in terms of internal structure. Um, it's still got the split bars. These split bars that we see in this hive design. You can see them in both hives. Um, this one's just got a little bit more structure inside it. Uh, and you can see that it's made of plastic. Uh, plastic has some big advantages. It has some disadvantages too. So I'll try and be fair about this because these hives are built by my commercial competitor. So um, I, I would expect her to, you know, if she was in this situation, to talk fairly about my hives. So I'm going to try and talk very fairly about hers, um, which is not hard because they're good. There's nothing wrong with them, but they are quite different. And it's a great com com comparison and contrast with, with mine. So these are mine and they consist of three boxes. Um, they've got an extra box on top that we call the honey super and that super is separated from the two bottom boxes by this structure which we call the brood excluder not a queen excluder a brood excluder so in the case of a queen excluder what we're doing is we're keeping the queen out of the top box by um, by aperture size that's too small to allow her to pass in the case of a brood excluder uh, we're not worrying the queen could easily get through this slot in the back into the into the uh, uh, into this top box we just heard before how the, qu the qu honeybee queen would find any hole to get into the top box in the case of stingless bees they do not and the reason for that is that the queen stays within the brood chamber this structure built by the hive that consists of an external envelope of insulating material and then internal cells uh, and inside horizontal cells which we'll see um, she stays within there so we don't need to keep the queen out but we do need the hive to not build any structures above this level so that we can take this honey super off a hive and extract the honey um, without damaging any brood but we're not going to do that today we're just going to talk about splitting a hive which is um, dividing it down at this level the bottom box from the middle box 
which is the equivalent of dividing that bottom from this top okay so um, the only other thing I'll just I'll mention a few pros and cons about these hives this one is made of plastic which is a fantastic insulator so you can get away with thinner walls um, and it's very good material in terms of its durability and the elements it never rots it doesn't get termites it's got those advantages it does have a disadvantage though that it can suffer from condensation forming inside so if you do use this plastic material you need some way for that condensation to uh, to be able to be released and in this case the solution is to put a piece of timber in the bottom of that box any um, moisture any condensation that forms will run down to the bottom or get sucked up by that piece of timber and then it's connected it's um, the moisture can evaporate out through this hole in the bottom box so that's quite a good solution for the condensation problem that can form in one of these um, plastic hives all right so stingless beekeeping has the advantage um, there are a number of advantages one you don't get stung that's a big advantage in my mind but um, you don't need many complex tools uh, an American hive tool is really great for separating the boxes which the bees stick together very well uh, and I like to have a knife handy as well because we're gonna divide this box and we're gonna try and divide the brood into two two nice neat hemispheres one that sits in the top box and it's going to stay in the top and the other stays in the bottom. And uh, sometimes you just need to do a little bit of cutting. Normally you don't. Normally those two spheres come apart, hemispheres come apart very well. Because of the nature of the brood, of the species you have here, that the layers are in nice horizontal, the brood's in nice horizontal combs. And so simply, uh, they should simply come apart in two. Yeah, what stops them from collapsing? So the layers are joined together by little pil pillars made of a uh, kind of a, it's propolis. It's a waxy sort of propolis that they build their internal brood structures out of. And that keeps all those layers together and stops the layers above from dropping down. Okay, so um, we've got this hive here, which we'll use in a bit, li little, little bit later. We've got that hive there. We're going to split th this one with this hive. And then if we have a few more minutes, because the whole operation really does only take a very short time, uh, we will split this hive as well, using that box. Another aspect of this particular design, this three-part box, so this is a two-part box, so it's great for division. And there is a little trick for putting a honey, little honey collector on the top of these, which I can't illustrate today because I don't have the part. But um, this one is, has this, this honey super on it. And I talked about the brood excluder. Oh, I haven't mentioned these split bars. So these split bars um, help us to divide the colony into two even, um, two even halves. Um, the brood, as I said to you, is about 150 millimeters in diameter when it's fully developed, including the involucrum, that insulating envelope around the outside. So it's going to sit neatly in there. And um, the food will tends to be stored in all the corners and at the ends. So the food's sitting under these split bars and that will stop the food from collapsing down. Those split bars. When this full box goes on top of an empty, that'll stop the food from collapsing and then in here the brood won't collapse down because the layers of brood are joined to each other. All right, are we ready to split a hive? Um, yeah, question. Yep. The opening, is that on the back or the front? Ah, good question. So it is actually on the back and it's there for a reason. That's just not a random decision to put it at the back. The reason is, does anyone know the reason why you would have the brood? Ex it's at the opposite end to the entrance. And what's the significance of that? Ventilation, that's why the hole is at the back, for good ventilation. And that does help, that does integrate with the slot as well, for good ventilation, that's true. There's another reason. These bees tend to store their honey. So um, they, these bees store a lot of pollen and honey inside their hives. So I should make a point here. I am at a honeybee meeting, and I do have to make a confession here. And that is that um, the amount of honey that these bees store is minute. 
compared to honeybees. So we're talking about um, the maximum sort of honey production you can get out of a hive of stingless bees is one kilo per year compared to, I think the national average for Australia is about 50 kilos per year when you average it all out. So one kilo compared to 50 kilos, okay? So you get very little honey out of these bees. Yes? Yep, so the question's about a natural enemy, which is a bad pest called the small hive beetle, which you all know about. It attacks honeybee hives primarily. It can also attack stingless bee hives. So I did say before that honeybees have different natural enemies to stingless bees. That's the one example of a natural enemy that crosses over between these two types of bee, um, and that's the small hive beetle. Um, and um, your question was about it not having a second hive. Yeah, okay, so these bees do protect themselves very well against small hive beetle. When people say that a hive's been destroyed by small hive beetle, my first reaction is, oh, I wonder if it actually was destroyed by the hive beetle or if there was another problem and the hive beetle came in to clean up. Because uh, a healthy hive doesn't get attacked by hive beetle. So, you know, without looking at the specifics of your case, I, I can't really answer your question. So basically, is it an entry point for hovers? Um, it, no, it's not because there are only two small holes, so there's a small entry. So these bees um, like to have, uh, like to defend their entry very well. And um, one, I'm, I'm going to do something to help them to defend that entrance, which I'll show you right now. Um, they, they defend it very well with an internal entrance tube. So honeybees, you give them a hole where the bees can come and go, and it's, they, def, they put guards there, but it's pretty much an open, it's, it's a gap, and, the, and anything can basically come in, and then it's in the hive. Whereas stingless bees, behind the entrance, they have an, a tube that they build, um, and it's quite long, it's often 100 millimeters long, and they post guards along that tube, and they can bite their natural enemies. They don't have a sting, of course, but they can bite with their jaws, and they can also daub with propolis, and that's how they deal with small hive beetle, and they're very effective. Along that entrance tube, they keep reserves of propolis and resin, sticky materials that sticks down other insects, not them, not the bees, but other insects like small hive beetle. You sometimes see small hive beetles entombed in resin in the nest in, in that entrance there. Um, but this box, you made a good point, it is vulnerable straight after a split. So I'm going to give them a bit of a hand. What I've got here is some propolis that I've extracted from another hive. I could extract it from this very hive that I'm opening, but I, um, I'm going to... I've done it earlier so that it's a bit handier. And I'm just going to mould it into a bit of a ring. And I'm going to put that ring around the entrance. And I'm going to push it on. You can use honeybee wax for this too. And I'm, I've squeezed it a bit too bit too much, but I'm just gonna make a very small gap there. So those bees can come and go through that gap, but uh, that'll keep the hive beetle out and make it easier for them to guard that entrance and also protect against any weather extremes in the short term. Now these hives um, have another solution to that issue, which is, are they here? I can't... Is it in this bag here? Which is a plastic elbow, which kind of achieves the same thing. It's like an artificial entrance tube, um, which you can place in there, and that helps the bees to guard it. All right, so there's a another difference between these box designs and how they protect that entrance after a split. Okay, so... Let's open a hive. Now you'll be able to come close and have a look. They may or may not, they're, they're, they're variable in to the extent to which they fly. Sometimes they go crazy and they fly out big time. Other times they're, they're really quiet. So I don't really need to cut that. Um, so what I like to do is, is watch how it's opening and have my knife ready in case I do need to do any cutting. So these bees are coming out in reasonable numbers. And I don't think I am going to need to, do, I might need to do a bit of cutting on this one actually. Just a small amount. So, um, I can see the brood, I can see the layers, but they're sticking together a little bit. So I'm just going to use my knife just to gently separate that layer 
and pop it down in the bottom box. And I'll, I'll just nick it through there as well and drop that down in the bottom box. Okay, so um, one thing I've seen straight away right up front is a queen cell. So that's great to see. And there are probably more queen cells here in the top box. So there's a queen cell in the bottom box. I'll look for a queen cell in the top box too. So I don't know which half is going to be queenless generally. Oh. Okay, I'll show you the queen cell in a minute. Sorry, I've got a bee flying in my mouth right now. No bees were harmed in the, in the making of this. So we've got a lot of honey pots here. And actually, this is a bit of a messy split. We've got a lot of spilled honey, which I hate seeing um, because that can provide uh, a food source for the natural enemies if they get in. And there's a pupa. And I can tell it's a pupa um, because it's got structure on it. It's got wing buds. It's got leg buds. And it's even, its eyes are even starting to darken. Can you see the dark eyes? On that, uh, oops, dropped, sorry. That's, <laughs> that's pupil comb. Now, that's the oldest comb in the hive. So one major difference between honeybees and stingless bees is that honey, stingless bees only use their brood cells once. They have this constant process, sorry, of building, queen, of building cells. There's these bees just wanting to fly straight in my mouth. Building a new batch of cells, provision, mass provisioning, provisioning them. So this is another major difference between honeybees and stingless bees. You will have learned about honeybees and how they, um, the queen lays an egg in an empty cell, and then the nurse bees are feeding the, the, the larva that hatches meal by meal. That's what we call progressive provisioning. Provisioning is feeding the larvae progressively as the larvae grows, just a meal at a time. Whereas these bees mass provision a cell. They put in, uh, they build a cell, they mass provision, put enough food in that cell, the nurse bees put enough food in that cell uh, to feed the larva right through to pupal stage. And then, only then will the queen accept that cell for laying her egg. And then the bees close that cell immediately. So the larvae aren't in open cells like in honeybees. The larvae are in closed cells. So really quite different to honeybees. And then those, um, the, the larva develops, consumes that food, pupates, and then the adults emerge, as they're about to do from this brood here. The adults are about to emerge, only a few days away. And that structure then, as the adults emerge, it's just packed up by bees and either recycled, the, 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 whack, the resiny tops and bottoms of those cells is recycled in the hive, and the pupal case, the cocoon, is taken outside and dumped. That's happening um, in a wave that moves upwards. So cells are being built upwards constantly, new fresh cells, and they've been added to. And above them are the oldest cells in the hive where the bees are emerging. So there's a space forming from the emergence of bees, and following that is another wave of brood cells being built up into it. It's, there's a, dy a dynamic process of um, cells being built and bees emerging, it's constantly moving uh, through this hive. So when you open a hive, you don't know what you're going to see, what age cells you're going to see. What we're seeing everything here now with this hive, if you look down the bottom there, in the bottom of through this brood that I'm holding on, so there's one ring of old brood, there's another semicircle of old brood, and underneath that there's brood that looks a bit different, a bit different in colour. That's the young brood. And you'll also notice around the Around that spiral shape there, there's a batch of open cells. That's the current batch of cells that are under construction. All right? So they are being built, and next step, within a few hours, they'll be provisioned, the queen will have laid an egg, and they'll be closed, and then they'll start on another batch. Every five hours, they build a new batch of cells. That's about five batches of cells every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. <sighs> Even Christmas Day. <coughs> oh, that one went down. <coughs> Sorry, folks. That one went straight down. <coughs> so I'm going to put that back in here. Okay, there's a few other things I'd like to show you. So what I think I'll do, I think I'll just um, proceed. 
And we have everything that you need for a good strong hive here. There's heaps of food. There's pollen and there's honey. There's, um, there's brood and there's bees. So everything you need um, for a good new hive. So I'm just gonna couple this one. I think I'll put it down like that and place this bottom on top. Now I think normally they put the, these openings on the same side, but I think it's better to do it the other way. Unless you want me to, all right, I'll do it the way they do it. <laughs> which is to put it on the same side. And, um, and that's just gonna fit straight over there very nicely. And I'll turn it upside down. And that's basically it. That's all that you need. Another one. There you go. All right, what you gotta do is you gotta come in and to these pools of, squeeze this bulb, put it in the pool of honey there, draw it up. So if someone would like to take that around and just drop a, uh, a couple of drops on it, the fingers of people who would like to try it. <laughs> it's priceless. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so that's going to go in there. Is everyone happy with that now? How about we split another hive? I think I've got about another... Ten. Yeah? Question? Um, yep, yeah, the question is how long do adult stingless bees live for? And it's a lot longer than honeybees. It's more like a hundred days on average and some will even live longer than that. So yeah, they're very long lived compared to honeybees. Honeybees have a kind of a life in the fast lane whereas these bees are slow everything down a bit. It's gonna be pretty similar I think, but you do see different things. As I said to you, depending on the position of the advancing front, because it's constantly moving upwards and you never know where it's going to be, you'd see different things. So let's see what we see this time. Oh, a bit of tape there. That's all right. That's just holding that closure. Okay. Can't see through you, please. Down. Thank you. All right, so this one is coming apart very, very nicely. No cutting involved. And we've got, we're fortunate with this one. We've got an advancing front right in the middle. So that's the best case. See, there's a natural division. There's no, um, these, these layers are completely separate. They didn't have to do any cutting. There was no tearing or cutting required you see these cells here here they look they look a bit of a different color and what do we see what's the, the the key that tells us that's the advancing front that's where the bees are currently focused most of their rearing at the moment all of their rearing at the moment how can i tell that open pots there are open pots as if you count those open pots there, there's about 60 of them 60 to 80 open pots maybe more in this case so 60 by five times a day, 300, that's about the product, the daily productivity of these bees, about 300 new bees being added per day, which is a bit lower than honeybees. I think honeybees are like one to 2,000, aren't they? One to 2,000 honeybees reared every day? Yep. So, um, this one's gonna come apart really nicely. I'm going to pop this top. So these are the older cells. What would I see if I open these cells? Pupa. Pupae, absolutely. What would I see if I open these cells? Well, pu a pupa is singular, in strictly right, speaking. No, Pupae uh, is a plural. <laughs> pupas, you can say pupas. <laughs> Eggs, absolutely. That's what you would see. <laughs> you know, the best thing might be, what about we get people just coming through? How about we get people um, doing a little bit of a um, bit of a conga line through here? Maybe starting from which side's the best? Maybe coming through here, where, where you are. Can you just pass through this way? So these are the older cells, the pupil cells above. These are the younger cells here. Right. This is the advancing front where they're building new new cells right here. So it's the open ones that you're looking for when you're doing a split? Yeah, yeah, if you get the advancing front like that, it's a perfect case, but you can split without, uh, without uh, uh, without it being at the advancing front. 
And how many beads would be in the typical hive? Sorry. Have your phone loaded up so you don't have to take time loading it up when you're here? Because this is all propolis. So these bees tend to tend to use um, um, all, propolis for all of their nest construction, as opposed to honeybees that use wax and just propolis for a few specialised. But you could harvest some propolis from st some of these um, structures here. So if you wanted propolis for beekeeping, like I did, I put a um, a, a, a propolis ring on this tube, then you could you could get some now. Keep coming through, thanks. Yes, come come over this side and let these folks come through and have a look. You can split any time. Um, well, not cold the weather, but um, you could as long as you've got the brood that comes apart. And it usually, you don't. You've just got to check it, try it and see. <laughs> yeah, beekeeping by observation. And this species in southeast Queensland, we divide them every year. Okay. But here in Sydney, you might be looking at more like every second year. Okay. It's colder. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it, it can be warmer here, actually. You can get the heat extremes here that are worse than in yeah, Queensland. Yeah. But you, um, generally, it's co cooler, and that slows the bees down. Okay. Yeah. So these bees can't... Honeybees have this amazing ability to control the temperature inside their colony, which means everything just keeps going at the same rate, regardless of what the temperature is outside. These bees can't do it as much, so when it's colder outside, they will slow down inside. Everything slows down, the rearing of larvae, all of their activity, everything. How'd you go over there? I might come over here and continue this splitting over here now, but not yet. Let those bees go in. And here. And we can put that closure on there. And we can put that. I'll wipe that surface off there so there's no... Sorry, there may be... Now there is another technique that's becoming a lot more popular. And it's, we call it soft splitting as opposed to this, which we call hard splitting. And the soft splitting is more... Um, it means you don't have to open a hive. You can just link an empty hive in front of, connected by a tube to an older hive, and it will, they will bud off or adduct um, into that second box. And uh, a lot of people are preferring that technique. Um, it's much slower, but it um, possibly... So, some people believe that it's, got a, it's safer than, than this hard splitting. Two. Yes. Uh, yeah, these hives have two entrances. That's the way they're built. That's the way they're designed. Oh, so which, Both which? of those blocked off. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, but this one's open, and this is there. Actually, I'll take that one off because that's the. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. No, it's this one that they'll go into because this is the one they know. Okay. Yeah. See over here, this is the one that they're they're yeah. familiar with. So. Uh, I mean, that's the queens in there as well. Ah, uh, we don't know where the queen is. Okay. Yeah. So which hive will they all go back to? Then? Will they go back to the original hive or? Um, well, what's, which one is the original hive? <laughs> They're both half original and half new. Alright, that's right. So do they self orientate back to the same orientation? They'll go back, they're very, very much orientated to the old position. So as soon as you um, move them back to that old position, they'll be fine. So you'd normally do this, of course, where the bees sit, generally. Um, obviously, we're, we have to do it um, for a demonstration at here, it has to be moved here for the demo, but um, yeah, you normally do it where you do the split. And a lot of people ask, what do I do with the second hive? And the, where people go to discuss this endlessly. And my belief is that it doesn't really matter. You can just put, you can put it nearby, you can take it a long way away. It doesn't really matter. As long as you leave one back in the original position. And typically we, we would leave the, um, the weaker one in the original positions because that's going to pick up all the foragers. Uh, yes, she's even the relative size of the queen of stingless bees is greater than for honeybees. So in the case of honeybees, the queen, she's not that much bigger, really. You know, she's got a bigger abdomen. But in the case of stingless bees, it's, it's very obvious who when you see the queen, she's much bigger. There's some fantastic pictures of the book of the queen in in my book over there, which I've got for sale. If I if anyone wants a copy. Ah, harvest the honey. So you'll have to come along to my full day workshop to see that. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
for five years, I monitored this process and um, I, I checked the, the success of splitting of a thousand hives, a thousand splitting um, events. And in 95% of cases, both halves survived. In 5% of cases, one half did fail. There was, there was two hives where both halves died. So that's 0.02 of a percent. So um, 0.2 of a percent, I should say. So below 1% of cases where both halves died. It's very rare. But were they ailing hives already? Or you can't tell? Uh, well, they were all strong hives because I okay. only split strong hives. They started off strong, but um, you know, a year later they were both dead. But it's very rare. Two, at, two cases out of a thousand. Would this work for all species of native honeybees? Uh, this one, this this splitting technique works very well for this particular species. So we're fortunate on the east coast of Australia to have a species. It's called tetra. It's scientific. There's no common names, unfortunately. The scientific name is Tetragonella carbonaria. So it often gets called TC. You might have heard of that shortening TC or carbonarias or carbs. Um, they are our subtropical species. Um, they occur from about Bundaberg in Queensland all the way down the New South Wales coast to um, Bega. And uh, here in Sydney, they're, they're pretty comfortable. It's getting you know, a little cool for them here, but they're pretty comfortable. So you can keep this species here, but it's the only one you can keep. All right, so you'll have to move to Queensland if you want to keep some other species. It's much darker. So the wax, is, so this is all propolis, but stingless bees don't use wax in a pure form. They mix it with, with tree resins and they use, so their building material is propolis as opposed to pure wax of honeybees. Yeah. Now I, I want to show you a little bit of a trick here. It's pure propolis. Yeah, that's right. And that is, thank you. He read my mind. Uh, I'm going to tape over the back of this slot um, where the brood excluder is and just do a little bit of a nick there to stop the bees coming up and now what we can do is put this box down on there and it works as an observation hive for a period all right so we can just use this honey super as like a lid and when we want to have a look, we can look down in there and, and see them. So Andrew is taking this box right now. He's purchased it. So he's going to enjoy watching that brood. He'll see the queen. You'll see the queen tonight because she's going to come up here and lay eggs in those cells. And then those cells will be closed and they'll start building new cells. You'll be able to watch that process for a few days, maybe a few weeks, a few months if you're very lucky before they close it all over. And then he... He won't see the brood anymore, but he can see the building of food pots and all the other structures up in here.